I have not met until this moment. Sure. Howdy. Right. <laughs> I have not met Kerry uh, O'Quinn until this moment. We're old friends now. It's not just a phrase. And I'm fascinated to read his brief bio. The amount he's achieved is truly impressive. After an initial career in advertising, he found his way into the field of science fiction, fantasy, and science fantasy. And in it, he launched a prolific publishing business with dozens of news, news magazines and books. He then became a producer of soundtrack albums, video series, and actual events. In each of these fields, his creations, if you look at his bio, um, you'll recognize the names. These, were, these, these have made an impact. In 2001, to, I shouldn't say crown this because he's still going strong, but to mark a point, he was honored by the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films with its Saturn Life Service Award. He's still going strong today with a host of creative ventures, too many, he says, TV series, a stage musical, and a half dozen feature films, including Anthem. Today, reach for the stars with Kerry O'Quinn. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Um, um, can you hear me right? Yeah. Is that clear for everybody if I talk like this? Good. Um, the whole talk this morning is kind of based out of a book that I wrote called Reach for the Stars. I've just finished it. In fact, actually, I haven't completely finished it because in addition to the nine chapters of the book that I have written, there will be interviews with about two dozen famous friends that I know who have achieved great success in very unusual career fields. These are the people I'm particularly tuned into, not the folks who travel in the mundane lane, as I call it, but those who are reaching for a very distant star that is far away and almost impossible. Uh, that's a life process that I've been fascinated with forever. I haven't still, uh, my parents, uh, wherever they are, would be chagrined to know that I still haven't made up my mind what I want to grow up and be. Uh, I've done everything I wanted to do and I'm still doing a lot of new things. The musical I just wrote is something I've never done before. And uh, lo and behold, I wrote 22 songs for a, a, a Broadway show. We did a reading of it in L.A. Uh, a few months ago, and we're setting up a workshop production of it now, and I have a couple of producers in New York who are interested. Uh, the book is something I've never done either. Two projects that are kind of fresh on my table. And I want to tell you a little about the foundation for this book because those of you who are here are interested particularly in the world of Ayn Rand and objectivism, and that has an awful lot to do with what formed this book. I was born and raised in Austin, Texas, and at the age of 25, I moved to New York City because I couldn't wait. Austin was a nice little town, but it was a sleepy little town. And I was ready for the action. I wanted New York City, the skyscrapers, Broadway, all of that. So I went to New York, and after I'd been there a few months, a very good friend of mine that I had made movies with in high school and all kinds of stuff, he was in New York before me, and he said, you got to go to this lecture in philosophy that's taking place at the Roosevelt Hotel on Madison Avenue. And I said, you know, David, I took philosophy in college, and it's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> I said, all it's about is these crazy theories that, uh, you know, have nothing to do with real life. And it's all about, you know, you don't know anything for sure, and, you know, that's your opinion, and what's true for you is not true for me. And I said, it left me with more questions than answers. And I said, to my way of thinking, it's a game that college professors play with each other. And he said, no, you've got to go to this one. It's very unusual. It's based on the writings of Ayn Rand. And I said, I never heard of him. Who is that? Oh, no. And he told me about it, so I went, just based on his knowledge of me. I walked into the Roosevelt Hotel. There's a whole room like this, and Nathaniel Brandon is up there. And he gives a lecture on God, lecture number four of Basic Principles. 
Now, I was raised in the Methodist Church in Texas and grew up with what I would call very conventional religious beliefs. I believed in God and I went to church once in a while, mainly because we had a MYF group at the Methodist Church and we did shows. I was more interested in the show business than in the sermons. But I still, you know, came into that lecture believing. And in one evening, with infallible logic and a twinkle in his eye, Nathaniel Brandon destroyed God before my horrified eyes. <laughs> and at the end of the evening, I said, the guy is right. Everything he said is true. I can't argue with any of it. And I bought a paperback of Atlas Shrugged that Bob Hessen was selling at the front door. And I started reading this massive book on the subway going to and from work for the next three months. I signed up for the classes, so I started with lecture number four and went on with basic principles of objectivism. And of course, I was captured from that night on. And it not only, I mean, we all have a story about how we came here. And, uh, and that was the beginning for me. I was fascinated, they, they moved into the Empire State Building, built beautiful offices there with an actual theater. I got to know the Brandons. I became very good friends with Joan and Alan Blumenthal, who were almost like my parents for so many years. I can't tell you how many nights I slept on their couch. They had a great apartment on the east side. I was over on the west side in a dump. And uh, uh, just, I got a chance to hear the lectures once a week, and then over dinner, many nights of the week, Joan and Alan and my friend Gordon would talk about the ideas and integrate these abstract concepts into the practical actions of our life. And that became, I was very lucky to have people that I could talk with about that because a lot of people who took the lectures kind of held the abstract concepts as floating abstractions and didn't apply them very thoroughly. And I had a chance to work stuff like that out with the Blumenthal's. And they introduced me to the Brandons. And I began working with them at NBI and designing book covers and graphics and things of that sort. I was introduced to Ayn Rand and Frank O'Connor and all, the whole inner circle, the collective, as they call themselves. Now, I was just a kid, so I didn't deserve to be there at all. I was not part of the inner circle, but I got invited to the parties and stuff. And eventually when NBI started running a film series, because I had been running films at my apartment on the west side every weekend, and so they said, would you run the film series for us? It was called The Romantic Screen. And I said, yeah, duh, I'd love to. Uh, I said, you know what you need every evening to start the show? You need like you know, the 20th Century Fox logo or Leo the Lion, you need a logo that starts the evening that says this show is part of the Romantic Screen series. And I said, I'll create an animated opening for you because I had just built my apartment, a multi-plane, three-dimensional animation machine, kind of patterned on what Disney had created. I was fascinated with animation. I was an artist and a designer and I wanted to create movies. And so I created a, a little animation opening for them with music, and it opened the show every week, and it was quite a thrilling beginning to the different movies. Um, I'm gonna actually read to you some excerpts from my book, Reach for the Stars, which is not published yet. I do not have a publisher for it yet. I've been talking with several agents and publishers, but no deal has been made. So I will have to let David and the folks at Atlas know when it is published. They may be involved in some way, but I'm letting you know now. If anybody has a great publisher that you know that will not only print the book, but publish it electronically in all the different formats, and who will do some major promotion on it. No point in having a book if it doesn't reach an audience, and this is, this is aimed at an audience for sure. So. Let me just tell you a little about my life, the things I've done, and how that works into the ideas that are in this book, which I think are fairly important in terms of how to live life. 
1972, bubbling with youthful certainty that we could create a publishing company from scratch, Norman Jacobs and I rented a modest office at 34th Street and Madison Avenue in Manhattan. We bought used furniture, we built cabinets and counters, and we began figuring out how to publish magazines. From scratch is the right phrase because Norman and I started with $900 in the bank, $450 each, and neither of us had ever had any training in journalism or in business. Uh, we had met a few years earlier when I arrived in the Big Apple, fresh from the hills of Texas, and landed a job as art editor for a teen romance magazine called Intimate Story. It was at Ideal Publishing Company on Madison Avenue, and fresh from the streets of Brooklyn, Norman was art director of another Ideal magazine called Movie Stars. I think we were fascinated with each other because we were such complete opposites. Norm grew up in a Jewish-Italian neighborhood playing stickball in the streets and eating knishes. I grew up on a hillside of cedars and pecan trees in Austin playing cowboys and Indians and eating tacos. Norm married his high school sweetheart, Eileen, Whereas I found myself attracted to both girls and guys, and I had decided at a very early age that marriage was not for me. Norm's personality was and is aggressive and urgent, whereas I tend to be thorough and cautious. I'm sure that one of the main reasons our business succeeded is because we counterbalanced each other. Our decisions did not come from one harmonious point of view. Coming at things from different directions, often with volatile voices, was one of the prime assets of our partnership. The fact that our differences generated disagreements was of no concern to either of us. We were both devoted to the same goal, building a business that would yield creative freedoms, entrepreneurial opportunities, and profits that could finance other projects, fulfilling our dreams, and making even more money. Our differences kept us in check. Norm never made an important move on momentary whim, and neither did I. We never took action until we hammered a creative idea into a practical form we both liked. Our difficulties, our, our differences, provided strength for our company. As I like to say these days, argument is good. Vigorous argument is how lawyers and judges arrive at the truth. People who cannot deal with problems by arguing rationally withdraw into a realm that insulates them from conflict. <sighs> conflict is the stuff of our lives. Ask any writer or filmmaker. Conflicts and the struggles to resolve them are what human drama is all about. You must learn to relish conflict if you're embarking upon a lifetime mission to make a distant dream come true. Our infant company survived many early disasters. We totally did not know what we were doing, but we spent every waking moment of every single day thinking about what we were doing and how we could do it better. The fact that we actually built a multi-million dollar publishing and production business out of $900 and chutzpah pretty much demonstrates that any human can learn anything and do anything. And if you don't know what chutzpah is, ask a Jewish friend or any New Yorker. For our first three and a half years, Norm and I weren't able to give ourselves a penny of salary for three and a half years. We were designers, so we did freelance artwork on the side, packaging magazines for other publishers, designing letterheads for companies we worked with, creating advertisements to sell hair growers and sex toys. We didn't care what we were doing as long as it was legitimate design work and made money so we could eat. Norm had a poker game every Thursday night in Brooklyn and 
praise Yoda, he usually went home with winnings. I serviced several clients with my own graphic design studio. We were both essentially working two full-time jobs, one that was non-paying. We practically lived at the office. Norm's wife, Eileen, once said, you're more married to him than I am. Many times during those early years, Norm and I were forced to develop new skills. Our first magazine was called Daily TV Serials. There were 14 network soap operas, five days a week, with millions of addicted fans. But there was no quality magazine that covered this field with professional journalism. Ours was the first, and because of that, we were welcomed at all the shows. Soap operas were gaining a growing audience in those days, and Barbara Walters devoted a week to the field on her Not For Women Only daily talk show. I was invited, along with Agnes Nixon, creator of All My Children and One Life to Live, to be her guest for the entire week. Now, I didn't have time to watch the soaps myself. I was busy running, starting a business. So I was not an expert on the storylines, but I had come to appreciate the skill and dedication required to produce those captivating daily dramas, essentially live television five days a week. I was thrilled to add my personal appreciation to Barbara's salute to soaps and to promote my magazine and our soap opera newsletter, a one-of-a-kind publication mailed first class every week to fans who just couldn't wait for a monthly magazine. We added the force of our publications to push NBC to stage the very first Daytime Emmy Awards. And we devoted a whole issue of the magazine to coverage of that milestone event at Rockefeller Center Plaza. Norm and I learned to photograph interviews with soap stars, to shoot on stage and backstage at daytime TV studios, we wrote articles, we designed ads, we licked envelopes, we swept the floor, and we carried out the trash. Several nights, under the constant pressure of deadlines, I remember leaving the office as the sun was rising over the East River, grabbing breakfast at an all-night joint on 23rd Street, on my way home to Waterside Plaza, collapsing for a few hours of sleep, and returning to the office for an afternoon of more work. We never minded the difficulties. What we lacked in experience and funding and staff, we made up for with self-generated determination and a willingness to do anything that needed doing. We were without adequate financing and training and planning and personnel, but we were building a business. We were living our own Horatio Alger, Steve Jobs, American free enterprise success story. The opportunity to build whatever success our abilities could forge. We were reaching for the stars. We published dozens of magazines. The Beatles Forever was our first one shot and it made a lot of money. TV Show People was our second monthly magazine, and it lost a lot of money. <coughs> Future Life was a magazine we started dealing with tomorrow's science and space technology, the real side of science fiction. Cinemagic was one of my favorite magazines because it trained young filmmakers in the techniques of production and special effects, and as it turns out, launched quite a few Hollywood careers by addressing, telling young people how they could make a movie in their own backyard with, you know, duct tape and coat hangers and a dollar ninety-eight, and do what industrial light and magic was doing in San Francisco for George Lucas for millions of dollars. And uh, we also published uh, Gore Zone, a horror magazine, comic scene, car design, allure. Uh, which was a magazine that didn't last very long, and we sold the title to the magazine that's on the stands today. Rock Video, Country Rhythms, Teen Idols, two dozen magazines, most of which are not still alive today. Starlog 
our science fiction magazine was my special child. I've loved science fiction since I first looked up and saw the universe. But we had to fight our distributor in order to launch Starlog. He said, you have a success with daily TV serials because you found an audience out there that's big enough to sustain a monthly newsstand magazine. There is no audience that size for science fiction. There's, there's a few people with funny pointed ears that show up at a hotel once a year for a convention. That's all the audience there is for that field. Star Trek is off the air. It was canceled by NBC several years ago. There's no science fiction around. And that was all true. But I knew that there was a hidden underground science fiction audience out there. And so I gathered a mountain of evidence about the fan clubs and the fanzines, the conventions, the fact that NBC had produced a third season of Star Trek after canceling it because more than a million fans had written an unprecedented thing and they revived the show for one more year. We started cautiously publishing Starlog quarterly, but when Star Wars exploded and made the cover of Time magazine, it was our cover too, and from that moment on, science fiction was big time and we were the voice of science fiction for more than 35 years. Our horror magazine, Fangoria, my evil child, is still alive 40 years old, and it's more popular than ever. It has a web series, uh, a weekly radio show, streaming videos, DVD catalog, fan conventions, all kinds of stuff. We launched Starlog in 1976, our bicentennial year. And in addition to my chores as publisher and later producer of soundtrack albums, books, videos, and live events, From the Bridge was my monthly writing responsibility. It was the opening column each issue in Starlog, the letter from the publisher. It was an intellectually refreshing contrast to the routine business matters of the company and organizing my thoughts each month for a topic aimed at intelligent young people provided me with engaging mental activity and I was able to relate philosophical ideas and values to concrete specifics. My thinking abilities had been amplified by my years at NBI. In addition to lectures on philosophy, I attended classes that clarified my ideas on aesthetics, psychology, economics, I took it twice because economics is not my subject, and I had the good luck to have Alan Greenspan, the, later the Fed chairman, teach me economics, and a whole lot of other subjects that NBI taught. Barbara Brandon was executive vice president of NBI, and for many years I worked with her and Wilfred Schwartz designing book covers, brochures, and graphics for NBI. Um, Barbara, who years later wrote The Passion of Ayn Rand, with the biography that was made into a Showtime movie starring Helen Mirren, uh, is still my very good friend. We're, we're living in LA now, and Barbara is my frequent date to shows and, and dinner, often at her ex-husband Nathaniel's home. It's all cool now. Uh, so I love to say I'm, I'm taking your first wife to have dinner with you and your fourth wife. <laughs> kind of wacky. For more than 250 issues of Starlog magazine, even after I sold the company, I continued writing my From the Bridge, each installment I explored a variety of subjects and in the process I formed and focused my own view of human existence and how we build happy lives. My new website which is just set up, it's not yet finished, but it is set up. It's called carrieoquinn.com, and from the bridge is my blog now. I was writing a blog in the magazine before there were blogs, so check out carrieoquinn.com. Uh, it's my firm and absolute conviction that no realistic goal is beyond reach. If a person can dream of something, a person can have it, provided the dream is logically attainable. I could never be a great violinist or a wrestler, 
your dream must be something you're physically and mentally equipped to do. It must be possible. A star you can see with clear eyes because it's real and it's reachable. What prevents most people from getting what they want in life is a lack of conviction that their dream can come true and a lack of fuel to propel their pursuit. Reach for the stars is a confidence and energy booster, providing the knowledge to believe in your dream and the octane to go for it. I've attended hundreds of science fiction and horror conventions around the world, from sea to shining sea. I've sat on the floor of hotel hallways into the wee hours talking with fans about what they like and what they don't like, about the passions and puzzles of life, about reaching for the stars and why so many people settle for less. And during these early years of objectivist fever, I stayed up many nights discussing ideas, debating with friends, wrestling with the processes of integrating new philosophical concepts into the practical actions of my life, clearing out the garbage accumulated in childhood and dealing with the conflicts between emotions and reason. In those days, I loved all-night intellectual explorations, and I learned a great deal about how to operate as a human on the planet Earth. When Hollywood director Brian Singer, who did The Usual Suspects, the X-Men movies, the first two, Superman Returns, Valkyrie, and his new one, Jack the Giant Killer, when he was a 17-year-old fan living in New Jersey, Brian came into Manhattan one weekend for a science fiction convention in order to meet Isaac Asimov and me. Uh, Brian, who's now a very dear friend, told me the story of how he and I stood in the hotel hallway for over an hour one day, and he told me how he wanted to make movies. And I said, Brian, please tell me I encouraged you. <laughs> And he said, oh yes, you did, it was wonderful, it was great. When I first met Robert Rodriguez, who is the Austin filmmaker who does Spy Kids and all those movies, he told me he entered a video in our Cinemagic short film search when he was a student in Austin. It was a little backyard production using his family, and he said it didn't win a prize and it shouldn't have, but he said the score sheet for my entry had a handwritten note at the bottom that said, you didn't win this year, but I think you have promise as a filmmaker, and if you keep working hard, someday you can make movies. And it was signed, Cary O'Quinn. For years, I read every letter from readers that arrived at our Park Avenue offices. I came to know our audience intimately, to care about them profoundly, and to love them as my companions, Many fans have asked me to collect my columns and publish them. Many have told me they clipped and saved a favorite from the bridge that gave them hope and inspiration. In those days, I wrote my columns on a typewriter, looking at a blank wall, not knowing if my words were read, much less understood by anyone. I knew Starlog was selling, but I didn't know if I was merely writing to myself or actually touching and affecting others. Over the years, I've received some dreadful letters from parents and teachers, especially concerning our horror magazines, Fangoria and Gorezone. Letters like this one from a concerned school teacher. Quote, I confiscated your trashy Gorezone magazine from a student in my sixth grade class today. I'm filled with absolute disgust that you publish such filth. I tore the magazine to shreds in front of the class, and when I arrived home, I threw the pieces into the fireplace and watched it burn. It's obvious that you publish such filth with the intention of making a profit at the cost of warping children's minds. I think you are truly sick. Your trashy magazine should be against the law. And a good Christian woman, a mother, wrote me, you're turning our children into evil serial killers, and you will surely roast in hell, Mr. O'Quinn. I arrived at Hollywood 10 years ago, ready to apologize. I started meeting amazing people who are making movies. 
people who grew up reading my trashy magazines. And to my delight, I find that I did not make a profit by inspiring a generation of serial killers, but by inspiring a generation of filmmakers. A couple of years ago, J.J. Abrams introduced me to his Star Trek composer, Michael Guccino, who also composed the score for Lost, the TV series, Mission Impossible, and Super 8. Michael asked me to sign his copy of Starlog number 35 because my column, Invisible Death, was an important inspiration. In Michael's Academy Award speech, accepting the Oscar for Best Music Score for Up in 2010, he expressed the essence of that column in his own heartfelt words, encouraging young people not to let negative reactions from those around them destroy their dreams. A few years ago at Comic-Con in San Diego, I complimented Guillermo del Toro on his Hellboy movie, and he replied before a crowd of fans, Carrie, none of us would be in this business if it weren't for you and your magazines. Recently, I received a Facebook message from a man I've never met, Peter Briggs, in England. He said, in part, I am the co-writer of the movie Hellboy with Guillermo del Toro and a number of other Hollywood genre movies. I'm about to direct my first feature, Fanzer 88, with Gary Kurtz producing. I want to thank you for your editorials. They fueled me in the drive to get out of the hick town I came from and crack the film industry. My dad always said I'd never do it, and I'd wave your editorial at him. When I sold Alien vs. Predator to Fox in 1991, it was in no small part due to the pushing you did. Thanks for being there to inspire a generation. I owe you, in part, my career. So I have learned that the ideas I expressed in those magazine columns influenced many creative young minds, and I know those ideas are still valid and potent. The twists and turns of my life since I sold Starlog have added a great deal to my experience and my knowledge, and I've gained a broader view of human life, and I'm a better writer now. So I can help people reach for the stars far better today than I did back when that's what I was doing. Although Reach from the Stars started as a simple answer to requests for my collected columns, I quickly saw that in order to present an integrated start-to-finish system for making dreams come true, I would have to reorganize all the ideas I had hurled at readers in small monthly handfuls and write this book anew, laying out what I now know to be the foundation and the essential knowledge and attitude for success. Here are the nine chapters of the book. Backstory describes my background, my struggles and successes, so you know the mind that generated the words you're reading, why I wrote the book, and how I see the unique soul of those to whom I'm speaking. Be prepared presents several challenges and warnings to establish the ground rules up front and to encourage you to open and sharpen your mind to connect firmly to reality as you read and think and evolve and reach. The Secret of Life explores the general purpose of human existence, why fables and fantasies are not a valid basis for forming and pursuing goals in the real world, and why challenging personal ambitions are the key to human happiness. Learning explores how to discover emotional values hidden deep within yourself, how to accept even the unacceptable ones, and how to identify and define specifically what you most want to do in life. Dreaming explores the ways in which conscious dreams are an important part of practical pursuit. How to cultivate your dreams, how to fuel realistic pursuit by fantasizing. How you can maximize your creative fuel. Heroes 
looks at the role of inspiration in human life. How to fuel yourself by using both fictional and real heroes to help bring out your own heroic spirit. And how to turn your admiration for others into fuel for your own goals. Planning explores how to create a blueprint for action, why you must have a plan before you begin, and how forming and defining it generates motivation for the struggle ahead. Struggling explores developing the right attitude, some problems and challenges of reaching, some practical ways of keeping the flame alive during difficulties, discouragement, and depression, all of which you will feel, and how to overpower those negatives by finding enjoyment in your struggles, how to relish the reaching. Succeeding explores how to make the most of the home stretch, how to reach the top without toppling, how to enjoy fueling others with your success, and why you must continue reaching, why the goal that you set up is not really your goal. In Starlog, I wrote to a young science fiction fan audience. In my book, I'm speaking to a much broader audience, but many examples I use throughout the book from my experience are based on my knowledge of what I call the unique soul. Science fiction fans are unique souls. I think the group here is also a, a group of unique souls. These are the people whose dreams are not conventional, who are distant, who are almost impossible, and these are the people that, if they can make their dreams come true, will actually change the world in which we live. That's why they're my special target. Those are the people who probably have the least confident, confidence that they can do the amazing things they're aiming to do, and yet those are the most important people on the planet. So in the backstory chapter, a lot of the unique soul is described. And uh, I hope you will relate to that. I feel sure that you will. I want to just tell you that I'm interviewing about two dozen people for this book. And we're going to videotape it and probably put some stuff up on my website and YouTube and things like that. J.J. Abrams, Chad Allen, Dustin Lance Black, Barbara Brandon. I have recorded interviews with several people who are no longer here, like Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who was a dear friend, Gene Roddenberry, who was also a wonderful friend, Robert Creus, Wes Craven, Howard Cruz, Jason Curry, Joe Dante, Guillermo del Toro, Tom DeSanto, Michael Gacchino, Toby Hooper, Nichelle Nichols, Leonard Nimoy, Cody Lindley, George Lucas, Robert Rodriguez, Tom Savini, Bob Shea, Brian Singer, George Takei. Some amazing people who are talking about success, how they've done what they've done, what they've learned along the way, and what advice they have for others. It's my firm and absolute conviction that um, people can make the most amazing things happen in their lives. And in the process, build their own self-confidence and happiness. This book explores the notion that individuals not only can go out in the world and make their wildest, most distant dreams come true, but if they want to enjoy being alive, they must do that. Here's a practical step-by-step -step guide to operating in the real world, discovering your most profound passion, planning how you can make it happen, and generating enjoyment as you engage in the struggles that all grand and glorious goals require. This book is for dreamers of all ages, anyone with a unique soul and boiling passions. To reach for the stars is to engage in a practical quest for your most distant dream, to dedicate your energy and intellect to goals so high that grasping them requires heroic escape velocity. It's the difficulty of the challenges you take on 
and the dimension of your efforts that will earn whatever pride and happiness you enjoy in life. Yes, my friends, you can have a joyous and positive and self-confident existence on earth by always reaching for the stars every day of your life and by relishing the reaching. Now, thank you.